a haven for sailors in port, the Red Hook section of New York was notorious for a century for its vice. Now it's famous for its hospitality to the arts. There could be no better example of the new cosmopolitanism than jazz vocalist and musician Cyril Lemay, whose global repertoire reflects her many travels and family heritage from France, the USA, and the Dominican Republic. Canapé catches her waterside in the mood to perform. Some folks were born and made to win the flame. All they're red and white and blue. And when the band plays, hail to the chief. All they point the cat and at you. Oh, no, no. It ain't me. No, it ain't me. I'm no fortunate son. No, no. It ain't me. Music was always a big part of my life because my, my mother is from Dominican Republic, so she had salsa playing all day in the house. She loves dancing. My parents throw the best parties, and so there was always music and dancing in the house. I grew up in Samois sur Seine, which is the, the village where Django Reinhardt lived, the gypsy guitar player. And uh, so when I was around 14, I met the gypsies because every year there's a festival in his honor in my town. And so gypsies come from all across Europe in their caravans. And so I started hanging out with the gypsies and I became fascinated with their way of living. And uh, I made friends with this one gypsy whose name was Lumpy. And he taught me how to play guitar and I would teach him how to read. So the first song I learned was called Sweet Sue, and so then the gypsies called me Sweet Sue. And then I learned by heart all the Stefan Grappelli solos, all the Django solos. And one day someone gave me a four CD box set of Ella Fitzgerald, and I learned every note on those four CDs, and um, learning all the harmony and the improvisation and all the rhythmic patterns is just by singing all the time, any chance I get. If you want the thrill of love, I've been through the mill of love, old love, new love, anything but true love for sale. Appetizing your love for sale. What attracted me the most about this kind of music is the, the freedom in the improvisation. That's my favorite thing in music. It's it's why I make music. It's just the fact that you never know what's going to happen. You just see what happens at that moment. And it's, it's the same thing that attracted me in the gypsy way of life, which is just live the moment. The gypsies don't see, they don't see further than a week. And so it's really that, that, uh, that notion of just living the minute fully. no mistakes allowed in the loop pedal when you're playing a song because if you make one mistake the mistake is looped every single time as a singer it's kind of a dream you always have to be able to make chords because you're a line instrument so basically you you, you can't divide your voice and make chords you know you can't be like a guitar or a piano player and it was always my dream to be able to do that, just do a whole song by myself. It's a lot of fun for, it's a great toy for a singer to play with. Je salue les mains dans les poches, le cœur dans la gorge. Une semaine m'a semblé un an. Il s'assit tout à côté de moi, ma peau commence à brûler et je cache mes jours. 
I really like the English language for singing, but I do love singing in French. I also sing a little bit in Spanish because my mom's Dominican and I speak Spanish and a little bit in Brazilian because I tour a lot with a, a Brazilian guitar player and we have two CDs together and we do some bossa nova together. But um, there are some French songs that the lyrics just give me goosebumps. <laughs> For me personally, music is just a way of living. I, I love every kind of music. To me, music is just something that it's, you can't describe it because it's not something you can grasp. It's just you, you hear it and it puts you in a mood immediately. And I perform, it's, it's like home. <laughs> I feel like I'm more on stage than I'm not. <laughs> um, I love it, I just have so much fun. C'était bon? C'est à moi. Allez vous cacher, où vous voudrez. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf. In the 1960s, French director, writer, and actor Pierre Etex delighted audiences with his inventive comic films. In their witty use of image and sound, they were influenced by a Texas mentor, Jacques Tati, and the silent masters, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. A legal dispute kept the films off the screen for decades. But now they are back for a new generation to discover. C'était lorsque j'étais à l'école primaire et on nous récompensait une fois l'an et la première fois où j'ai vu un film comique, c'est un film d'Harold Lloyd et ça me faisait mourir de rire. J'ai rencontré Tati euh, d'une façon tout à fait fortuite. J'ai entendu un jour à la radio, il était interviewé et il disait qu'un jeune qui sait dessiner a plus de, de, de facilité d'arriver au cinéma qu'un autre parce qu'il peut formuler ce qu'il veut par le dessin. Et j'étais frappé par ça. Par ailleurs, il disait qu'il était très amoureux des clones. Et moi, euh, c'était mon idée aussi. Donc je lui ai écrit, il m'a répondu. Et lorsque je suis venu le voir à Paris, j'ai apporté des dessins que je présentais à un journal, des dessins d'humour. Il a regardé ces dessins et il m'a dit « Vous avez un don d'observation et le sens du gag. Est-ce que vous voulez travailler avec moi ?» Mais j'ai dit « Je ne connais rien au cinéma. » Il m'a dit « Ce n'est pas difficile, le cinéma c'est très simple, vous verrez, vous comprendrez tout de suite. » Et je me suis mis au travail. Alors j'ai fait toutes les étapes de façon artisanale. C'était sur le film « Mon oncle » toutes les étapes d'un film, c'est-à-dire l'écriture du scénario, la recherche des gags, ensuite dessiner les personnages, ensuite le décor, ensuite les accessoires, j'ai tout dessiné. Et lorsque le film a commencé à se tourner, je fus son assistant à la mise en scène. Et j'ai été jusqu'au bout, jusqu'après les mixages, après le son, etc. J'ai été jusqu'au bout, j'ai même dessiné l'affiche de son film.
me semble plus important de, de séparer ce qui appartient au théâtre et qui est le verbe du cinématographe qui permet justement de s'exprimer visuellement. C'est-à-dire que pour moi, les situations sont plus fortes que le dialogue. Une situation que tout le monde peut reconnaître parce qu'il l'a vécu ou qu'il l'a vu est une situation forte. Elle passe les frontières et c'est comme ça, à mon avis, qu'on a un langage beaucoup plus large que lorsque la comédie s'installe avec le verbe. Il est très important dans le cinéma comique de montrer au spectateur de façon évidente ce qui doit être vu. Et je pense que lorsque un décor est trop coloré, lorsqu'il y a de la couleur partout, on ne voit pas forcément ce que l'on doit voir. Dans un plan large, lorsque le décor a une unité de ton, s'il y a un élément de couleur qui apparaît, c'est cet élément-là qu'on va regarder. Et je pense qu'il en va de même pour toute chose. C'est comparable à la musique, c'est comparable à la peinture, c'est comparable à tous les arts. C'est très difficile de présenter un film comique parce que, dès l'origine, c'est une situation extrêmement simple. Et quand je dis simple, pas simpliste, mais très simple. Or, lorsqu'on dit un homme tombe amoureux de sa secrétaire après dix ans de mariage, il n'y a pas de situation plus simple et plus bête que celle-là. Mais c'est ce qui est à l'intérieur d'un film comique qui est le plus important. Et c'est la seule chose qu'on puisse raconter, le slapstick les gags, la façon dont on exprime certaines situations par des choses d'ordre visuel ou sonore. Parce que le son est très important aussi. Très important, mais pas du tout, dans, encore une fois, dans le sens du dialogue, mais des effets de son. Il faut refaire tous les sons de la nature pour que ensuite ils aient l'air d'être vrais, alors qu'ils sont une transposition. Je sais que dans tous les films comiques de la grande époque, euh, Keaton particulièrement a toujours évoqué le son à l'intérieur de ses films. C'était une frustration de ne pas avoir le son dans, du temps du cinéma muet. Et c'est une des choses qui est les, la plus précieuse que Tati fut le premier à révéler. Il y a une chose que j'aimerais que beaucoup aborder. Je, je sais qu'il y a aux États-Unis une espèce de mépris pour M. Jerry Lewis, qui pour moi est un des plus grands cinéastes comiques à travers le monde. Et je ne vois pas sur quoi repose cette espèce de refus qu'il a, qu a subi. J'ai vu récemment une critique dans laquelle un, 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 un journaliste disait très justement « Longtemps, j'ai regardé les films de Jerry Lewis comme des choses peu importantes, et puis avec le recul du temps, lorsque je les ai redécouverts, je me suis aperçu à quel point cet homme avait du génie. » Et je voudrais dire aujourd'hui aux Américains, je voudrais leur dire qu'ils ont un trésor et qu'ils ne le savent pas encore probablement. This is the young lady who looks and typifies the young lady who would dress and be waiting for her beau to pick her up to take her dancing today, nowadays. And this is how they dance.
Romantic dinners are usually set in a dimly lit space. Dim, however, is not dark. Against that distinction, in 1997 in France, the idea of dinners in complete darkness appeared as a project to bring awareness of the challenges of blindness while offering a unique experience. Fifteen years later, more than one million people around the world have attended dark events at spas, restaurants and other venues. Canapé visits Dans le Noir, a restaurant in the heart of Manhattan. Most employers don't give the chance to someone with a disability. The founder of Don Le Noir is Edouard de Broglie. He decided to come up with this unique concept of dining in the dark, giving the opportunity to people with disabilities of all sorts, mainly with being visually impaired or blind. So now I'm going to explain the table in front of you. In front of you is a napkin. On your left of your napkin is your fork. It's definitely a role reversal. It's nice to be the one to be able to help. People tend to be very genuinely interested and want to know um, how you do things. And it's just been wonderful. You literally see their eyes open up in the dark. You use your finger as the dot. We have four menu, one being the chef white surprise, followed by our red menu, which is our meat eaters, then a green, which is our vegetarian, and a blue, which is our fish menu, and everything else from there is a mystery. different scenario where you have also have flavors that contrast and are very bold that get complemented by some flavors that aren't as bold the smell has to be there it's more along the lines of the, the mystery and also the other aspects of eating a dish other than what it looks like it's just you really have to focus on what it tastes like and the texture we actually present food just like it would be at an old restaurant with a few minor adjustments like we do separate things a little bit more and things are more bite-sized uh, no bones in the food just so we don't have any incidents where somebody bites into something and they choke on a bone. I have a white, a red, a green in the middle, and a blue on the bottom. I do miss this way. Here you go, coming over your right shoulder. Yeah. Automatically, your other senses kick in, like your sense of hearing, um, just a sense of smell of the food. Which of your senses has kicked in so far the most? Mm. Taste. Yes. 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 It's interesting. It's a little intimidating. It yeah. is. Yes. You have some potatoes. I'm not sure if the really? fish is cod. I'm, I don't know. It's a white fish, I think. And it's good. It is. Mm -hmm. And then once you come back out from the dark room from doing the experience, we'll present you the menu with the description and photo of the menu that you've had. They're really taken back to exactly what they've eaten in the dark because they're just so prone to be eating, you know, chicken and a basic meat. I thought I was eating cod and it was actually salmon. Mm -hmm. Ostrich, oh my god. <laughs> I'm typically a, a, a picky eater, so I usually look at everything I eat and then often will take stuff out that I don't like to eat or put it to the side, but with this, <laughs> you know, I, I had no choice but to go for it. Apparently, I, I was trying to uh, cut things with my knife upside down. With me, it's everything is about presentation as the food comes out, and we take advantage of the sight and eating with our eyes. And at this particular moment, we were able to just, you know, indulge on the food by, based on taste, smell, um, I actually put my hand over it to make sure it was hot. Definitely, the, the your sense of taste is it explodes because you cannot rely on sight. The taste, the textures, the company. This experience will definitely teach a lot of people uh, how to properly use their palates when it comes to you know, food in general, um, how to identify food by more than just what it looks like. It's a good culinary experience. It's also a good personal experience, which there's a lack of that in Manhattan. It may not be you know, an ongoing thing, but at least try it once and get the full experience. It's Overall, mostly a lot of fun. Not many people can say they have a lot of fun at their job. I do. Au nom du président de la République, 
nous vous faisons commandeur dans la Légion de Neuf. Ah, merci bien, monsieur Abbasé. Born in 1908, the American composer Elliot Carter was called the last survivor of the heroic age of post-war musical modernism. He attended the first American performance of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring in 1924, studied composition in the 1930s in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, and won a Pulitzer Prize in 1960. At the age of 103 in 2012, he published a new work, received the French Legion of Honor, and passed away. Canapé salutes the artist. What, what effect, what influences me. I've known so much about music, both all the famous German composers, Bach, Beethoven, and so on. And I've also known Debussy and Ravel, and, and, and that, that, all of that somehow is in my music, but it, it's, uh, it's, it would be hard for me to tell anything about it. I don't think about that. I don't think about it that way. I just write what I like to hear, and I don't really care where it came from. America is a very different kind of a country that all small countries in Europe are. So that the idea of making, a, of writing pieces of what might be called American music that would run through the whole country is, is impossible because there's such a variety of different people. But now, I think my music it does, it does appeal and is more frequently played in Europe than it is here. And I, know, I don't know if that means it's because it seems to them American or not. <laughs> <laughs> 